and what it is about the visual, I think, the visual medium, it, it's there, it's in your face, but arguably the written medium can create much more horrific images, but, but they're in your own mind. When we enter the bloody chamber, we think we're going somewhere we know, and then Carter completely destabilizes that and, and forces, to, forces us to reevaluate things that we've been taught and, and to see things in, in a very different way. So Cinderella, Snow White, that whole idea of, of young women wanting to be princesses, all of a sudden you see the princesses as, as victims, as objects. And, and I, I think it raises questions and it will keep raising questions. Um, I think when they started to be written down in the 16th and 17th century, they were becoming children's stories a little bit more, but I don't think that they really became fully considered children's stories until the kind of Victorian times, um, when they were beginning to be aimed more at children. And that's also when the kind of moralising and teaching strand came into them as well, because that was quite a big, um, a big defining feature of Victorian storytelling. The original fairy tales, the ones I've read, were clearly darker and, and exploring the unknown. I think they then became the subject of, of children's stories. They, they became sanitized. And I think that probably reached its peak with, with the Disneyfication of, of fairy tales. And again, I think that's why Carter's so interesting, particularly teaching it to a generation now who've only ever had the, the Disneyfied version of, of Prince Charming to the Rescue. And then, of course, Carter says, no, it doesn't have to be the prince. It can be your mother. Necrophilia, paedophilia, incest. I always think the snow child manages to fit everything in into such a short story, which is perhaps why it's so shocking. For me, the, the necrophilia for me is almost like the lie back and think of England attitude to to female sexuality that you know he doesn't want an active woman he wants a passive woman and a, a dead woman is about as passive as you can get I mean she literally has no life in the story and interestingly as well no voice so the book is written through the eyes of Humbert, Humbert. And you are absolutely in his world. There's no escape. And he is, like I say, seducing you into his story. It's, he uses the literariness of it, I think, to, to sort of seduce you into thinking, this is a very serious book. You've got to, you know, it's for the intelligentsia. It's not pornography. And so you sort of get drawn into the whole, the, you know, you, the, the whole sort of plot and what's going on. To, it, it sort of takes you along by the nose, sort of thing. And, uh, to have a 12 year old girl, you know, visually to, doing, being abused like that or taking advantage of or, or being seductive and apparently seducing him would have been. Um, Sort of criminal in a way, it, it, because we don't see the narrative through the eyes. He hasn't got the camera, sort of thing. You're, it, you're a third person. You're an observer, and that makes a total difference to the to the whole book. The whole, you know, it, you, it cannot be the same. So I was in a film uh, called Gerontrophilia, which was directed by Bruce the Bruce and premiered at the Venice Film Festival. And Bruce is a very uh, recognized filmmaker in gay cinema, but also he's sort of, I would say, the leading artistic film filmmaker. Um, so when I got the job, a lot of my friends asked me, like, do you know who you signed on to? Because he typically directs pornography. Uh, and I was surprised to hear that because of in reading the script, it was very tender, and though it is about uh, a fetish, which is a, a young man who is only attracted to geriatrics, um, I think the way that they made it sort of not smutty and not just for shock value was that they tried to tell a very tender love story, and um, Bruce 
used a lot of his references and artistic methods. He based it on a lot of um, Robert Altman films and um, romantic comedy type films from the 70s. So he really wanted it to have like to be character driven and have um, nothing gratuitous. And I also think that he was able, the, the shocking moments of the film like aren't really sexual at all, but it's when you look at the older man's body, he has a nude scene because it's like, we don't see people of that age on film ever, and you never see them naked or expressing any kind of sexual desire. So I thought really that was the most envelope pushing and shocking thing that he could have done was not to direct a pornography starring like very beautiful young men, but to really look at how the body ages, but how desire doesn't fade as you get older. In the case of Durantophilia, I was just, it was kind of an experiment for me to try to make a film within the, a certain kind of uh, narrative uh, genre, like the narrative mainstream film, kind of referencing romantic com romantic comedy a little bit, but more like, uh, or, or romantic drama, um, and grafting a very kind of unusual or controversial story onto this um, onto this uh, this experiment um, so what happens is the audience has a certain expectation of what this kind of film should be like or what kind of characters you would expect and I'm asking them to accept the same thing, but with an 18-year-old and an 81-year-old. So it was kind of an experiment to see if that would actually work and um, and how far I could push the film into the mainstream while making a film which I consider subversive.